The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary and the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Happy Easter. The gospel text for today is from the very end of Mark. And the end of Mark is really amazing. Usually, at the end of the gospels, people see Jesus, they talk to him, he tells them important things. He ascends to heaven. This is typically the way we think about Easter. Triumphal, victorious, glorious. It's a kind of winner thought process. We'd like to hear that music group Queen play, We are the champions, my friends. Really? Not this time either. <laughs> They've had a whole service to think about it. But that is not what we hear at the end of Mark today. No, at the end of Mark, we hear this. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Although winning is the most popular way we might think about today. The truth is that this reading from Mark really more closely resembles who we are as God's people. See, at the end of this Gospel of Mark, the author wants us to remember just what the price was that Jesus paid for our sins. We are not the champions today. Christ is. We are the ones that receive God's grace. The only champion here today is Jesus Christ. If you remember our Lenten journey this year, we have intentionally been thinking about theology. Remember, theology is simply thinking about God or how we think about God. And what Mark asks us to think about today is, <clears throat> after finding the empty tomb, do we proclaim a theology of glory or do we proclaim a theology of the cross? A theology of glory would have us thinking about God in a way that emphasizes human effort 
And we would conform then to the cultural expectations of God and to the cultural expectations of other believers. On the other hand, a theology of the cross helps us to think about God in a way that emphasizes God's work rather than human work. And a theology of the cross then overturns the cultural expectations of God and the cultural expectations of other believers. A, th a theology of the cross seeks God first in everything. In confirmation, we use a curriculum called Here We Stand. And there is a skit in one of the lessons. I'm going to share a piece of that now with you. There are two characters. One is a theologian of glory. He'll stand here. And the other is a theologian of the cross, and he'll stand here. It goes like this. Theologian of glory says, I have kept God's law so well. Theologian of the cross says, God's law is perfect for me. A theologian of glory says, if I ask for forgiveness, God will forgive me. The theologian of the cross says, God forgives my sins. Theologian of glory, if I pray about this enough, then God will do something about it. Theologian of the cross says, God cares for me. Theologian of glory, I love God. Theologian of the cross, God loves me. Being a theologian of the cross helps us to realize the hope and love that God has given to us all in Jesus. Hope and love are central to understanding a theology of the cross. Let's take a little closer look at hope. Hope has been expounded upon by many authors. Most recently, I have heard a quote about hope that has really got me thinking. How many people are familiar with the book, or perhaps the film, based on the book, The Hunger Games? You may raise your hand if you have. That should be just about everybody. Really? Nobody ever raises their hand. But I bet a lot of people have heard about The Hunger Games. Although I did not read the book, I did see the movie. And I gotta tell you the basic plot for you to understand this. So, it's a future time. There are no longer wars, but this strange game called the Hunger Game, in place of wars. The Hunger Game is a fight to the death for those playing the game, and it is a punishment for a previous rebellion against the Capitol. The president of the Capitol is played by veteran actor Donald Sutherland. He is known as President Snow, who appears to be not so nice. Katniss is the main character of the story, and she inspires hope in the people. You see, in the future, many people are starving, and there is little hope. For some people, the future is now. At one point, a television producer wants to exploit this sense of hope that Katniss is inspiring. So the television producer then is called to appear before President Snow to talk about this. And this dialogue happens from President Snow. He says, Hope, it is the only thing stronger than fear. A little hope is effective. A lot of hope is dangerous. This fact is fine as long as it's contained. Now, in the blogosphere out there, this quote has been repeated by countless people as a way of thinking about the church in a very negative aspect. That the promise, the hope, that we experience here today, this Easter morning, is a hope that is kept contained by the church. In other words, as Karl Marx said, religion is an opiate for the masses. 
I can understand that some might jump to that conclusion. But in order to do that, you have to ignore the sacrifice of Jesus and the love that God has for us. In the light of Easter morning, in the theology of the cross, the promise of God in Jesus Christ, the hope that is given to us on Easter morning, that hope is not contained. It is a hope that bursts forth from the tomb. I agree that hope is stronger than fear, but if a little hope is effective, but a lot of hope is dangerous, I would like to introduce you then to the most dangerous person in the world, Jesus the Christ, who allows us all to hope well beyond death and well beyond religion, any religion. It is a sacrifice of Jesus and the love of God, a theology of the cross that shatters the beliefs of those who try to thrust their cultural expectations on those who follow Christ. The love of God in Jesus Christ, it is beyond our understanding. And yet love is the thing that every human being craves and that God gives to each of us, only we scarcely recognize it. Okay, so here's going to be the strangest quote you hear from me this year. I heard the other day on the radio, they were interviewing Lionel Richie. You know, the songwriter and musician. Stuck on you. And that's all I know from that one. How about, <laughs> that's why I'm easy, easy like Sunday morning. It's Sunday morning. <laughs> He talked about how when he was with the Commodores, he became, thankfully, the ballad writer. The other guys worried about the funky tunes, and he got to write all the ballads. He says he understood something about the world that made it easy for him to write all those famous love songs. Lionel says, See, I think the whole world is dying to hear someone say, I love you. I think the whole world is dying to hear someone say, I love you. And I certainly agree with that. But I wonder sometimes if we as Christians are not listening close enough because God tells you, I love you, every time we look at the cross. If Mark was the only gospel text that we had ever read, at the end, we would be wondering, what will these people do? They've heard that Jesus Christ is risen. They have not seen, but they are amazed, and they are afraid. The question might be the same for us here today. Will we say nothing to anyone? once we leave here today? If we do speak, will we conform to a public expectation of what we should say, of what we should think, a theology of glory? Or will we retell the story, one of sacrifice, one of pain and suffering, and yet a story of hope, a story of love, a theology of the cross. Are we willing to live that story? And so we pray. Gracious God of everlasting life, we pray that you would help us to always remember the sacrifice of Jesus, to remember the cross, to remember the pain and suffering, and to remember the resurrection of Jesus. Help us to keep your promise of everlasting life in our hearts. Help us to receive your abundant love so that we might share it with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.